Good afternoon. I uh, hope everyone uh, can hear me clearly. Uh, I just want to say hello and welcome to the webinar. Um, welcome to this webinar hosted by Vixio Payments Compliance. Uh, today, our panellists will be looking at the UK's recent regulatory developments, the future of open banking and how the UK and EU may diverge on the issue for the payments industry. Uh, my name is Jack and I'll be running the webinar uh, from behind the scenes. Uh, before I hand over to today's moderator, Jimmy, I would like to uh, quickly remind all of our attendees to please engage as much as possible today. We're going to have um, plenty of opportunities to ask questions. Uh, we'll be running a poll. Um, we want to get as much engagement out of everybody as possible. Um, should you have any audio or visual issues or questions related to that matter, can I please ask you to write that in the chat box? Um, and I would also like to remind everybody that today's session is being recorded and a full version of the recording will be sent out afterwards, similar to some of the other webinars we've done in the past. Um, now, without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand over to um, today's webinar moderator and Victoria Payments Compliance Senior Journalist, uh, Jimmy Franklin. Thank you very much, Jack, and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. So, to start off, I'm Jimmy and I work with the editorial team at Vixio Payments Compliance. I will be sharing today's panel and don't we have a stellar, stellar set of speakers for you. At the end of the session, we will be taking questions as well, so please don't be shy, make sure you get them in. Um, now, four years ago, almost to this day, bizarrely, we're about a week out from it, I was starting in my first journalistic job and my editor sat me down and said that my first assignment was going to be to research open banking and look into how banks were adapting to it. She gave me a list of people to speak to and one of those being the panelist, I'd like to start with the introductions today. So in Elixir, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. I see that open banking for you as for all of us is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nelix Devlukia. I'm chair of the Open Finance Association, an industry body working across the UK and Europe. And our members are all fintechs on the demand side of the open banking ecosystem. Fantastic. And then, Andrew, we can go to you. Fantastic. Hi, um, hi everyone. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so my name is Andrew Self. Um, uh, in contradiction to what it says on the slide here, I do not work at TrueLayer. I'm at the um, Payment Systems Regulator. Um, so I'm a senior policy manager there. Um, and one of the things I do is I look over um, and oversee our work on open banking and account account. We apologise for that slight technical glitch, Ben. <laughs> and, uh, and Gavin, if you can please let yourself be known to everyone. Thanks, Jimmy. Hi, everyone. I'm Gavin Punia. I'm a partner at Bird & Bird International Law Firm. Um, I'm a partner in the financial services re regulatory team in London and advise uh, a number of different players within, within the payments ecosystem, ranging from account providers, card schemes um, and uh, acquirers, merchants and marketplace platforms. And uh, also advise a number of open banking providers, both on the account provider side and on the third party TPP side as well. Fantastic. Yeah, so I think we're definitely going to be able to take it up to the hour today of the discussion. Um, but now before we start, I thought I'd give the newcomers here today a taste of what we do at Vixio Payments Compliance. We exist because regulation is complex. And if you're a payment service provider in Europe, let's be honest, it's only going to get more complex in the next few years. We provide insights, analysis and monitoring on all things payments. This includes direct payments regulation, such as the PSD2 and the interchange fee regulation, as well as other legislation, such as the money laundering directives, GDPR, and upcoming acts such as DORA and MECA. So as you can see with um, these headlines and our regulatory updates, for us at Vixio and many of you tuning in as well, um, open banking has been an incredibly pertinent topic that we've all become quite invested in over the last few years. And regarding open banking in the UK, I personally think that it's been a bit of a success story for us thus far. We've advanced way quicker than a lot of our neighbours on the continent in many respects, and the government still seems genuinely very interested in and enthusiastic about the <laughs> Um, the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, last, uh, Andrew Griffith, said last week that this will be the year of delivery on the next generation of open banking. 
So, with this in mind, we now have a little poll to get started if people are able to answer. And in this poll, it would be fantastic to know what is one key issue holding back open banking in the UK today? So I'll give everyone a bit of time to just respond to that. Right, I think that should be enough time now, perhaps. So um, regarding the results of the poll, uh, functionality quite far ahead at 49%, followed by regulation at 34% and performance at 17%. Um, so I'd like to ask our panelists, um, what do you make of the poll results and how do these align with your thoughts on um, the app, uh, on the poll itself. I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> Shall I go first, Fed? Yeah, you can go first. Um, so I was interested that functionality was higher priority than performance. Uh, I would say that the fact that we don't have well-performing APIs is a barrier to having better functionality and I think the 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 response on regulation was to be expected because it's it's um, incremental in the in the UK we've got the regulation that lays the foundations and then from mm. my perspective that's what we should have as the core uh, and the right mandates in place as we move forward then we should have well-performing APIs, and we shouldn't be talking about parity anymore. It should just be well-performing APIs that do what they need to do all of the time. And then that will actually support the functionality because that will then allow the innovators and industry um, and everybody to come along and plug in and provide the really valuable services and products that consumers and businesses are going to want going forward. Absolutely. I don't know if either of you want to contribute on that as well, Gavin and Andrew. I mean, I think it's to be expected that, um, I mean, all three of these things are incredibly important if open banking is going to move forwards and is going to develop in the way that we want to see it develop. Um, to sort of echo um, Alexa's comments, I think um, core to us as the payment systems regulator is seeing this genuinely move forward and seeing retail transactions happen via open banking. To do that, we think you need performance and functionality to be probably beyond where they where they currently are. And we, we said that in the, in the JROC report. Um, and I think that the, the point on regulation, the score on regulation is quite interesting because it sort of sort of reflects what we saw through that strategic working group process, where some some parts of industry see it as sort of a, you know what, industry can do a lot of this themselves. And other parts of industry see a need for quite firm regula regulatory um, action. So it is quite interesting to see that there is a bit of a broad spread um, across all three of these areas. And I do think they are all very, very important. I, I, I think if any one of these things um, doesn't move forwards from where we are today, I don't think we're going to see um, open banking really take off in the way it could do. Yeah, I, I, just following on from that, I think. You know, seeing regulation as, as the second most um, important issue there, I think, reflects an interesting perspective in, in relation to uh, that tension between is, is regulation there to serve as a framework or actually, as Andrew just said, does it play a more crucial role in actually laying down more uh, specific uh, requirements on firms so that that pushes um, the, the, the development of open banking itself? So. Um, we, we can discuss some of that, I, I think, during the course of the session. But that, that is the kind of interesting tension, I think, within the industry. Is regulation there to play a more vital role or is it there as just a framework to allow um, the, the players within the ecosystem to, to drive open banking forward? Absolutely. And uh, speaking of um, JROC or the Joint Regulatory Oversight Committee, in Griffith's speech, 
last week. He was referring in part to the JRUC report, which was published on Monday. Um, and this outlined plans to advance open banking beyond the implementation phase. Um, so very exciting on the whole, particularly for me as a journalist in the PSD2 world. Um, the JROC's recommend recommendations contain a roadmap of priorities over the next two, year two years, covering five key themes. These are levelling up availability and performance, mitigating the risks of financial crime, ensuring effective consumer protection if something goes wrong, improving information flows to third party providers and end users, and promoting additional services using non-sweeping variable recurring payments as a pilot. So uh, quite a few key themes there for us to, to mull over. Um, I'd like to turn to Andrew as our regulator in residence today. What is, uh, can you talk us through it a bit and uh, what, what is your take on this on the whole? Uh, yeah, I'm really happy to. So um, firstly, a big thank you to everybody that inputted through the, the process. These themes really do fall out of the work that came through the uh, through the strategic working group. So I'm sure there's people on this call that inputted into that and were probably involved in pulling together the report, but it did form a really key evidence base for us. Um, so I'm not going to focus too much on the, the themes um, as I give you a bit of a, a high level walkthrough um, of what's in that, that JROC publication, but it effectively does three things, right? So it sets out what we see as the next steps on the role of the future entity. Um, and, 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 and sort of sets out some key principles that I think are, are relatively difficult to disagree with um, and then indicates that some detailed design work um, needs to happen over summer so we can really start to see movement towards that, that future entity. It then um, does a quite important, uh, important job of setting out where we are in terms of the long run regula regula <laughs> regulatory framework um, and in particular, where government are in, with regards to um, new or additional or enhanced powers for the regulators going forwards. Um, and we've set out some quite powerful things um, in that report, which is effectively Treasury will be looking at the DPDI bill to um, provide a smart data legislative regime around um, open banking. And it also says that they will ensure that the PSR has the powers necessary to oversee payment systems elements of open banking. Those are really important commitments to have um, in the report. And the last thing we do is set out the roadmap. Um, and this is the bit that I think has got quite a lot of in interest and, and attention um, in industry, because I think we set out quite an ambitious plan for the next phase of, of open banking. What we've tried to do is set out a, a sort of a, a three step staged approach to the next phase of open banking. So in the sort of, in the near term, effectively now, this year, um, we wanna see those things where there is broad industry consensus moving forward and being deployed. So better data in terms of API availability, better data in terms of fraud, and where there is genuine industry consensus, effectively, let's just get on with it. Um, and then there's the sort of a, an interim um, set of deliverables where we know that there is still contention um, and still disagreements in, in industry as to how you go about doing it. But we want to see, particularly for lower risk use cases, we want to see more open banking use case cases enabled. And um, we've said in the report by the end of this year, if possible, um, and that's sort of where we're, where we're, what, we're what we're looking at um, as, a, as a joint regulatory oversight committee um, and this means bringing forward things like vrp and really thinking about which types of use cases can be enabled um, and we see that as a stepping stone towards that long run sustainable framework for open banking um, and what we want to do is we want to learn and understand through that sort of that interim step what needs to happen to make the long run framework work so we know that for a long run framework, you're going to need a commercial model which works for parties. We, you're going to need the functionality and capabilities that, that enable these different use cases. You're going to need dispute processes and liability frameworks that work. Um, and you're going to need to make sure the availability um, of APIs is there. Let's work through these stages to make sure that we get each of those things lined up by the time that we 
um, enable or, or the industry enable um, open banking across a wide variety of use cases, which, as we set out in the report, could mean a, a sort of a, a, a bigger multilateral agreement that puts the framework around um, open banking. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. And Nalixa, I wonder at um, the Open Finance Association, uh, how, how has this been received at the moment? So from the perspective of our members, we are very pleased with the, the statement made by Andrew Griffiths that this year is going to be the year of delivery for the next generation of open banking. We are very supportive of the the scope of the JROC report. Um, and we are also pleased, and, and I'm bringing this in because it's part of the, the jigsaw discussion that CFIT is going to be looking at open finance as its first coalition. Because for us, um, everything that we are going to achieve in the open banking ecosystem is foundational and a stepping stone for the open finance ecosystem. Um, Obviously, Andrew has um, highlighted a lot of the key points in the report. For us, it's it's very, very positive that we now have um, clarity that there is a need for legislation and that, you know, the DPDI bill will be the vehicle for that. We have clarity on the fact that um, the current open banking implementation entity has a mandate to progress with non-order items. We're um, hopeful that it will progress the, the items detailed in the report, which picked up on the concerns of our members and TPPs generally about unlocking functionality and fixing the problems within the current open banking ecosystem. And um, we actually believe it's going to be key that industry and regulators work in close collaboration with each other because that is the only meaningful way in which we are going to deliver uh, to the timelines and the ambitions within the report. Certainly, I really felt that collaboration was quite a key um, area in the JROC report, so it will be interesting to see how that plays out over the next few years. Um, Gavin, it'd be great to hear your take on, on JROC as well. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, for me, there were kind of two key uh, areas or issues that I picked up on. I, I think I was enthusiastic about in terms of um, I think the, the PSR or the joint uh, the JROC uh, committee identifying the, the relevant areas. One of them being kind of around levelling up and the the fact that there's a recognition of there needing to be commercial models in place, particularly for account providers, to come to the table and have some incentive to provide uh, more dedicated APIs or APIs for particular use cases to provide access to, to TPPs in a in a better in a better way. Um, and we can talk about that maybe during during the course of the session. And the second part is around consumer protection uh, because if we if we want to try and drive um, greater adoption of open banking, whether that's from a account information data perspective or from a account to account payment perspective, I think consumers need to, to see that there's protections around how they, for example, purchase goods and services and that there's similar protections in a way to, to card payments where you have chargeback rights and Section 75 rights for the way you use a credit card and whether some of those protections can be uh, interwoven into some of the, the standards for account to account payments. And obviously, you know, industry and different uh, stakeholders will have views on that. And whether you know they they're able to adopt that because there is a cost and resource perspective in in implementing some of those protections for consumers. But I think it's a great start in recognizing in recognizing that that is is needed in order to drive greater adoption of of open banking. Absolutely. Jimmy, can I can I just come back on a couple of points that we've had? Um, commercial models is absolutely right. Um, it's vital that we have the right incentives within the ecosystem to move this forward. And our members are already working with other parts of the industry and industry associations on that conversation about commercial models and in particular, of course, non-sweeping variable recurring payments. Um, but I think we also have to be careful that 
when we talk about um, API performance, it's not limited to commercial models. We need to have a very clear baseline because we have the PSRs, we have a regulatory framework, and what is currently lacking is not um, poor performance in commercial models, it's just poor performance. Uh, and we need to address that. And of course, the commercial models are about the functionality and the additional, where they have to have core API functionality as well and performance as well. But we mustn't have the commercial conversation at the expense of, uh, in effect, what we call a baseline, where functionality per se has to be good and the commercial discussions are uh, an add-on to that uh, and leverage that. And, and I think the conversation, obviously, and Andrew touched upon it, Gavin's touched upon it, about dispute resolution and consumer protection is going to be vital. It links to the conversations about liability as we go forward. But um, from an OFA perspective, we are cautious about let's replicate what's in the card space. Um, we need to have the right consumer protections for account to account payments and open banking payments. It's not for us a given that that means we replicate what's the consumer protections in the card ecosystem. That's completely fair enough. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you wanted to respond to that. Yeah, I, actually, I wanted to sort of echo what Nadex was saying, particularly. So when you'll hear me talk about it, I won't be. I, I, I try and talk about um, at four distinct areas. Um, because I, I, I broadly agree with you that functional capability and the commercial model probably aren't, don't need to be that aligned. I think the other thing that's really important is, as, as an industry, when we talk about the commercial model, um, it's a really, it's a phrase that seems to mean very different things to different people. So if you talk to TPPs, they'll have one idea of a commercial model in mind. And if you, particularly if you talk to ASPSPs, they'll have an idea of a commercial model in mind. Um, I don't want to sort of cast aspersions, but often um, in that sort of space, the idea of sort of a card style commercial model is often the, the default that's thought about. I think one of the things that we, we have published and we have put in the public domain is the idea that the commercial model for account to account doesn't necessarily need to look like the current commercial model for card schemes um, and I think it is it's an opportunity for us to look at the commercial model and see how do you get the best outcomes for system users through, through that um, which doesn't necessarily mean a like-for-like -like approach that we see in card schemes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, Sorry, just, just rounding that, that off I think that's why I think it's important that in addition to the gap analysis I noted that with the consultation, it's if necessary, and I think it is important, as Nelixa say, says, is in addition to the gap analysis, there is a consultation potentially to industry to work out, you know, particularly with uh, TPPs, whether some of those those solutions in other industries, such yes. as uh, card, is something that's proportionate and able to to fly in the open banking space. Yeah, and get those right market and consumer outcomes right like that's that's the thing isn't it it's like how do you make sure you you actually get particularly in <laughs> the things i really care about making sure that commercial model drives competition at, at, at the actual hard phase of payments i think that it means that we're gonna everyone's gonna have to be talking a lot in the next few months to make sure that we're all keeping the collaboration going on this um yeah, and I think regarding JROC, obviously that does kind of link in as well with um, the UK consultation on the payment services regulation, uh, which is the other kind of key theme that we were going to discuss today. So with the payment services regulation um, consultation that came out, um, well, it came out earlier this year and then closed at the start of April. Um, this for me, very, very simple stuff that was being covered. Um, we had kind of various key themes being thrown out there in the consultation, whether that was more flexibility for bank transfers to help lower fraud risk, uh, again, kind of linking in a bit of the um, protecting customers from plan insolvency, which echoes recommendations, I think, made that were made by the European Banking Authority last year. And even free speech concerns uh, triggered by accounts being suspended by um, platforms over the last few years. So it's a very kind of varied 
potential overhaul of the payment services regulation that could be happening um, now that the consultation has closed. And here I'd like to ask you, Nalixa, what did you think was most significant in this consultation and where does this come as, as part of the, of the jigsaw for regulation? Uh, so, to be frank, the challenge when it was first published was when it said, oh, we're going to deal with open banking somewhere else. <laughs> and so we had to sort of align that with um, the, the other work that was happening. We had SWG, we had um, JROC, um, and then we had the PSRs. From, from the perspective of our members in the open banking ecosystem, um, it's positive that they're looking at scope and definitions. One of the challenges we have today is that obviously we have a definition of payment account, but payment account can mean different things to different providers, and therefore there is no consistency as to the accounts that are actually available within an open banking ecosystem. We think that this would be an opportunity to think about what I refer to as the baseline of what is the functionality and what are the requirements in order to have that basic, not basic, that's, but the ecosystem that's in the not chargeable for space, free space, I suppose, is what we're going to call it, uh, that's under the, the PSRs, and that works well and continues to work well. Uh, and, you know, how is that going to be aligned? Because uh, we think it's important to align that because that's what sets the clarity for what's in the commercial space. Because at the moment, some of the challenges in the commercial space are that everybody's doing it slightly differently um, and, and has a different view. But if you have this baseline, it's very clear where that demarcation is. And then there's some interesting, uh, and I say interesting because it's, it's, again, part of this jigsaw and challenging because there's discussion about fraud in the uh, PSRs. There's obviously um, the AppScan fraud work that um, the PSR is doing as well. And, um, and then we've got this thinking going on about the ability to slow down payments in order to mitigate high value fraud. Yeah. And one of the important factors to think about going forward is how all of that work cascades into the open banking ecosystem because uh, the discussions are about account to account fraud and obviously the open banking ecosystem is one layer beyond that in that the instructions go into the account to account ecosystem but what is the cascade and does that have unintentional consequences does it put unnecessary friction into an open banking journey that's then going to absolutely undermine that objective of competition and choice Absolutely. And I think the um, it was the first time I'd read about slowing down payments in a, in a little while. So I think that was a, an, in, an interesting point. Um, Gavin, I wonder whether you had any thoughts on, on the payment services regulation overhaul. And uh, yeah, it'd be, be great to hear from you on it. Yeah, I, I think it's notable that it's a call for evidence. So we're at the kind of very early stage and I think the process and I think the government to some extent is 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 relying on the industry to come back to kind of understand what was good about PSD2 or its implementation in the UK and what can be improved. And I think in an open banking space, it's notable that the government highlighted potentially uh, the prescriptiveness of certain regulations, particularly around strong customer authentication, but also noted that um, there was some flexibility um, post-Brexit in the way that the FCA could react and and revise, for example, strong customer authentication to allow less friction in an open banking context. And one of those examples was the FCA um, being able to remove the um, the, the requirement to, for, for account providers to apply SCA um, every 90 days. Um, so essentially TPPs only need to obtain their, their own consent from, um, from payment service users and those payment service users don't need to get a, or go need to they don't need to go through another round of SCA with their account provider. And I think that's a good example where the FCA reacted or or, or took their own kind of uh, approach to revise the, the the SCA RTS, which is now in the SCA handbook. And that's obviously been enforced since March 2022. And there's an 18 month implementation period. 
but I think that sort of example is is, is quite a quite good roadmap of what changes there might be in the future around a, a future payments framework and how it might be set out. It might be that it's more principles based rather than setting out strict um, standards or requirements from a regulation perspective, and it might be open to to industry or to the, the new open banking implementation entity to um, to set out those industry requirements. Nice. And I, I wonder, again, like um, regarding that kind of move to principles based, I think that might be, I mean, later on we're discussing the difference between the EU and UK, but that might be some an area where we start to see some changes happen. Um, obviously, we are at the call for evidence day stage with the payment services regulation. And I, I wonder, um, between all of these different things that are happening at the moment, we have CFIT, we have um, the Data Protection Bill. We obviously have the JROC report now and other things too. I'd like it would be good to know from you guys where should the priority be at the moment, and I guess as well, how do we connect all these different parts of the jigsaw puzzle? I know it's quite a daunting question to be asking everyone, but uh, yeah, I wonder if anyone would be able to to respond to that. Uh, shall I? Come yeah. In there? Sure. Um, <laughs> So how we do it, let me tell you what I think the happy path is, um, okay. and, th and then we can take it from there. So we need the regulatory hook in the DPDI for uh, a future implementation entity with the right mandate for read and write access. Um, we should take the lessons learned from Australia where they didn't have uh, read access from the start. Um, and we need to have the DPDI uh, also to provide the regulatory mandate that we will need for open finance going forward. And that needs to fit into the sort of the way that that legislation is drafted. At the same time, we obviously need to progress at pace with all of the JROC work um, to the timelines that we have. And the, the sort of the sort of bonus will be if we can deliver some of that, particularly on VRP and performance and functionality in an agreed industry way, that means that we don't have to go through any consultation processes, formal consultation processes with the regulators, because that will actually delay all of the timelines. Um, and obviously, the one thing I suppose that's really on the wish list is that we all have the, the manpower and the resource and the stamina to do it all. Mm. And I want, are the conversations already happening between different trade associations on this? Like, have uh, the Open Finance Association been reaching out to your to your counterparts elsewhere in the ecosystem already? Oh yes, yeah. We um we speak with UK Finance, um, the Payments Association, the EMA, Innovate Finance. Um, I shouldn't have named them all because now I'm going to forget somebody, aren't I? <laughs> and then it's going to be really bad. Um, F Data. I think that's everybody. But yes, we definitely do speak to the industry nice. bodies. Um, Codec. Nice, fantastic. I'm sorry I, if I've forgotten anybody. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot where I make your list, everyone. That's <laughs> but, my um, <laughs> And I think as well, like you were talking a bit about Australia Bear. I, I think there's always going to be a bit of an international element with this. Um, certainly for, you know, whether it's the EU or elsewhere, open banking isn't just exclusive to us. So um, regarding what is happening in the EU, obviously, while well, there's plenty of stuff happening here, there's plenty of work taking place in Brussels at the moment as well. Um, this summer, I believe we should see some traction on a potential PSD3, although there is a consensus in Brussels now that updates may not pass the finishing line before the end of the parliamentary term next year. Um, and there's also plenty of other stuff going on. The digital euro update obviously is supposed to be due in the next few months. Um, and, you know, we've also got the instant payments regulation. So, you know, as many, lots of legislation basically coming up. Um, Nelixa, Gavin as well, um, what do you make of what the EU and UK are doing? And is there that much difference between the two jurisdictions at the moment? I don't know, uh, Gavin, if, if you want to start. Well, I, yeah, I think from an EU perspective, there's, there's two things. There's one um, is the is, is the difference in the way that the payment um, architecture works um, 
in the EU versus the UK. So in the UK, we've been fortunate that a lot of the open banking is built on faster payment rails, whereas mm -hmm. in the EU, you have obviously national payment schemes, you have SEPA, but certain bank participants aren't part of SEPA, the single European payments area, which has its own real-time payment scheme. And so what we've seen with some TPPs is, is you know, an inability to properly access the, the accounts of some account providers. And even where they've been able to access it, particularly on an account-to-account -account ba basis, those payments have been subject to a high, high amount of fraud potentially um, because banks send back a, you know, a kind of authorization request, but they don't actually uh, take out the money until later in the day. So that's just one example where there is I think, quite a lot of friction from a kind of industry standard perspective. Um, and I think in the, the second point is that in relation to the approach to future payments regulation, I think a couple of years ago, the EBA was tasked with looking at PSD3 um, with no specific focus on areas such as open banking or open finance. Um, and what we've kind of been hearing is that although there, there, there are some recommendations made to the European Commission on things like open banking or open finance, actually the focus has been in other areas of, um, for example, merging of the electronic money directive with the payment service directive whether you know, things like account information should be within the payment services uh, regime at all and whether it should have its own framework. Um, and, and so I think, although they might be seen as being ahead in terms of what a future payments uh, framework looks like in the EU, I think open banking has taken a bit of a, a, a backseat, is, is my view, compared to, compared to the UK. That's an interesting point. And I wonder, Alexa, do you agree? Do you think obviously the Open Finance Association operates in the UK and EU? Um, has, has open banking taken the back seat there? Uh, from our perspective, not at all. We think that the implementation of course in Europe is more challenging because there's more fragmentation um, mm -hmm. and less consistency because they don't have a central implement implementation body as we do in the UK. And from our perspective, it would be beneficial um, if PSD3 could address these sorts of challenges um, uh, and again I go to this point about the baseline of if the, if the regulatory framework says this is in the, the mandatory PSD2, PSD3 space um, then all of everything that we've talked about so far today about commercial models and performance and availability is equally applicable across the UK and in respect of performance and um, functionality probably more so because of that fragmentation and lack of standardization um, and uh, you know there is work going out um, also at the UK level under the um, uh, was it SPA MSG it's called where they're also talking about um, a commercial model for um, I suppose the word is premium APIs but we've still got to have a conversation that goes beyond that for the future, I suppose, in Europe of variable recurring payments, variable recurring payments um, and what that could look like. I think that um, one of the big differences, obviously, that we are seeing is that we know that in the EU they're going to have two legislative proposals. They're going to have one for PSD3 and one for open finance. And from our perspective, uh, we believe it's important that AIS services stay in PSD3. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we understand, well, it, you know, AIS is about data and it should go to open finance. But we believe that that's going to cause unnecessary complication and friction because we've spent the past several years implementing uh, all of open banking and AIS services. And to move it to a new regulatory, frame, regulatory framework creates a lot of uncertainty for, for you know, our members and for industry. And from the conversations we've had, that seems to be the view on both the demand and supply side of the ecosystem, that there is a preference that AIS services remain in PSD3. I think the one thing that is important to everybody as we move forward is that 
despite the fact that there is likely to be divergence and differences given different political regulatory agendas, the more consistency there is across the jurisdictions, the better it is for member firms, and that includes you know, our member firms and, and for banks as well, um, yeah. who, who operate across both jurisdictions. Divergence has cost, divergence has complexity, um, divergence has challenges, both for the providers and for the end users. Um, and therefore, where it, it can be the same or similar, that is our preferred outcome. And then there's also that nugget that always crops up that's important to bear in mind is that the, the uh, equivalence point on allowing UK firms access to SEPA which obviously for all of industry that make euro payments is crucial. Yeah, absolutely. I think SEPA's, um, you know, certainly since the instant payments regulation um, came out in the autumn as well, I have noticed SEPA starting to come up a bit more and, and the UK's continued membership of it with that. Um, Andrew, I'm sure that you guys at the PSR do look at what's happening in the EU and elsewhere as well. I don't know if there's any particular jurisdictions that you have in mind that are at the moment kind of rising stars or perhaps leading the way on uh, on open banking so you know what yes we <laughs> we do a lot of work looking at um where open banking is in various jurisdictions and i mean we're, as a regulator we need to learn what works and what's been working elsewhere and why it's worked and i think and Alexa, to your point um one of the reasons i think the uk has been quite successful with open banking is the use of OBIE and standard and, and sort of unified standards that everyone signs up to and uh, that are, are monitored and enforced in the same way. I think that's one of the areas that we've done a pretty good job at. Um, but in terms of um, jurisdictions that we're really focused on, right now we're spending a lot of time looking at and talking to the Australians. Um, I think where, where the Australian model is going is really interesting. Um, and uh, the more people we talk to uh, in that space, there probably is some, some lessons that we can learn about where, where they are heading. Um, I, I have a, a team member of mine is getting married in Brazil um, in, um, in two months time, um, which is giving us a, a lot of real life experience of, of paying with PICs. Um, and again, it's another it's another market that we are really interested in because we've seen such good penetration and particularly such good penetration um, at, in, in retail payments. Um, but the challenge we face is the reason you've seen open banking be really successful in different jurisdictions is normally because of one key driving factor or a combination of factors, often not entirely applicable um, to what's happening in the UK. So um, the, the UK really is in a, a unique position. We have a dedicated payment systems regulator, which is a great place to be. So we have a bunch of people and a bunch of regulators that are, whose task it is is to make sure UK payment systems work well. Um, but what we don't necessarily have is some of the driving forces that you've seen elsewhere where open banking retail payments have really taken off. So there was a key driver in Brazil that they really wanted to implement um, an open banking style payment system and the government really, really pushed it forward and got behind it. Um, where we've seen open banking take off in the Nordics, it's been driven by the fact that um, uh, you weren't able to use cards online, therefore you were using your open banking and that spilled out into offline. It's, what what I see our job as, as regulator of doing is look at what what were those conditions for success elsewhere and what can we learn from that and how do we then sort of as our role of, of regulator in JROC and bringing together industry, how do we help set out that path that learns from what's worked elsewhere um, and also really learn from what hasn't worked? Okay. So we need to make sure that um, I sort of agree with with a couple of the points we made. We do really want to see these things move forward quickly. How do we make sure we don't go down paths that we know aren't going to work? Um, so we we have a big role in terms of horizon scanning and monitoring, and making sure we understand what the global landscape looks like. But there aren't any easy answers. You can't point to one jurisdiction and say, "Yeah, well, we're going to cut and paste that, and that's going to work in the UK." I'm not. I've not been I've not been pointed to that that example yet. Whether whether Nelix or Gavin can can do that um, and make my job a lot easier, um, I'll, 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 I'll let them answer. So Gavin, can you can you make Andrew's job easier? <laughs> uh, not on this occasion, no. 
<laughs> oh, we can actually obviously help make Andrew's job easier by working, collaborating with the regulators as we move forward with JROC. I think just to add, though, one of the reasons, just building what Andrew said, is that some of these jurisdictions have moved forward in the way that they have is because they're able to take our lessons learned. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, what we did in the UK was absolutely groundbreaking in how we did it and how it was implemented. And all of the rest of the world has been able to look at that. They still come and look at that and talk to us and say, what did you do? What did you learn? And it's been able to take that and implement it that's helped them move forward. And although there is, as Andrew says, no one size fits all solution, you know, we should be looking at what's happening across the globe and taking their lessons learned um, and, and bringing them back and implementing it in the way that's right for our jurisdiction and ecosystem. No, absolutely. And I have, um, I mean, it's been in our coverage quite a lot of VIX here recently, kind of, um, I guess the EU and UK's open banking and PSD2 plans tend to, we see them being replicated in, in some jurisdictions. So I think that is certainly a, a, a good thing. And uh, on the PIC subject as well, my housemate's partner is Brazilian and one of the first questions I asked him was about PICs. So, um, <laughs> <that, laughs> I and mean, I was like, yeah, I'm a paying journalist, so I kind of had to. Um, so yeah, I think that's on the whole been certainly some interesting discussion points today. And uh, I wanted to share some takes of my own um, on the next few years and what we can expect from Open Bank after seeing this webinar. Um, so with this, it, few of them, or well, firstly, I think the enthusiasm of the regulators and politicians that is still there, and this is across the political spectrum, I've seen this from um, Labour MPs as well as Conservative MPs, um, means that this is an area that is worth investing into. Vixio research has already shown that many players see this as a key opportunity this year, so knowing you have a regulatory interest behind you only enhances that. Yet, the realisation of JROC's ambitions remain to be seen. I wonder whether we could see some delayed, um, be dealing with some delayed timelines, or perhaps, you know, there was a lot of consultations being suggested. So, uh, yeah, let's hope that the industry and regulators are all chatting to one another. And in addition to that, um, covering both the EU and the UK, I am yet to be convinced that there will be drastic divergence between the two jurisdictions on this. I think this may bode well for some firms, as Nelix was saying, it does mean that there's less cost to operate in both jurisdictions. Um, and, you know, it will be good that firms will not have to necessarily invest tons into their compliance procedures and the kind of products that they are putting out there in the UK and EU. So, Without further ado, I think we can turn to our questions. I hope that people have been sending them through. Uh, there's still time to send them through as well in the next few minutes. Um, let's have a look. So I can see one we've got from the audience. Um, as regards to the roadmap, how do you expect to address the controversial cases of use, such as delegated authentication? Um, Andrew, I feel like I should come to you on this first. I don't know if you want to take this. Yeah, I mean, I think that. I guess the first the first answer to that question is we want to see industry work together and we want to see quick sensible answers where we can get them particularly within a framework that regulators have set about the types of outcomes that we're hoping to achieve and what we, um, what what good looks like now if there are really controversial areas that cannot be moved forward i think that is where where we need to look to the long-run regulatory framework and make sure regulators have the right powers um but Ultimately, this is the type of question that you may need regulatory intervention in to say that <laughs> we can all agree on the principles and where we want to get to. There will be some of those questions where industry won't be able to won't be able to agree. And I think that's where if you get the long term regulatory framework right and the regulatory powers, that's where you'd expect regulators to, to step in and, and have formal consultations to hear representations from all, all parts of industry um, and come up with what, what, what we see is, is the right answer. Brilliant, nice. And Gavin, I don't know whether you have, or uh, Nilix, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on this question. Gavin? Uh, yeah, I don't have anything to add in addition to, to Andrew on that particular uh, question. Nice, fantastic. Uh, Nilix, nothing to add at all? 
I think delegated authentication will become part and parcel of some of the commercial conversations that move forward because obviously the the underpinning issue for delegated authentication is liability. Fantastic, brilliant. So guys, um, it's been a pleasure to speak to you all today. We certainly had some very interesting points to cover and I think the rest of this year and going onwards as well um, for open banking will be well, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, so I'd like to extend my thanks to Nalixa, Andrew and Gavin for your um, input today. And I'm going to pass back to Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. And thank you again to our speakers, Nalixa, Gavin, Andrew and Jimmy. Um, as mentioned at the start of the session, um, this webinar was recorded and a video will be sent uh, to all those who registered in the coming days. I'll also ask you to please keep an eye out for an upcoming Q&A blog based on this session. Our thought leadership is built based on your feedback. So if you can please take 60 seconds to give us your thoughts on this webinar. Um, there's a link to a survey in the chat. Uh, if you're able to spend you know, a short amount of time just giving your thoughts on the, the topics we've discussed today, that will really help us. Um, although, uh, should you have any other questions about anything discussed in today's webinar, or would like any further information about Vixio and, and what we do, please feel free to email info at vixio.com and a member of the team will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, all that leaves me to say is to say thank you again for all of our speakers and thank you for everyone for attending.